Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today we'll take a look at a book titled The Inhabited Pathway, the built to work of Alberto Ponis in Sardinia, edited by Sebastiano Brandolini and published by Park Books. This richly illustrated monograph describes the work and thoughts of Italian architect Alberto Ponis. From 1960 onwards, Sardinia's northern coastline was discovered and altered radically by summer tourism, which brought patterns of living and architectural forms from other parts of the world to the island. Set against this sudden transformation, Ponis can be seen as a figure of opposition, one who has been inspired by nature by the landscape and by the island's own age-old building traditions. Through drawings and specially taken photographs, this monograph focuses on eight houses, all very different from one another. Each one represents a perfect symbiosis with its untamed natural surroundings. Inserted with great sensitivity into locations dominated by majestic granite boulders, the houses can only be accessed by walking along pathways, once used by animals and shepherds. And it is these pathways that give this book its title. This book on Alberto Ponis addresses at least five distinct themes that have been mixed up and superimposed to the point where it is no longer easy to tell them apart. Together they constitute a short but fascinating micro-history of Italian architecture. The first theme concerns Sardinia, specifically the physical and human geography of this large island. Although Sardinia belongs to Italy, it is still very far away. It's like a little continent all to itself, and one which perhaps has not yet fully engaged with modernity. The island's approximately 1,000 km long coastline conceals and protects a wild interior that is underpopulated, poor and sometimes even hostile. The second theme deals with tourism, which has perhaps been the principal force of transformation within Italy's borders over the last 50 years. The idea that tourism is always damaging and implies that everything gets concreted over is refuted by the absolute precision with which Pony's second homes are conceived and constructed. His houses are not in the landscape, they are inside the landscape, and this is the third theme. The fourth examines the house as a domestic space, based on the idea that it can and must, though its shape and its style, exert an influence on the behavior and well-being of its inhabitants. The house becomes a message of freedom and of empathy with nature. The fifth theme, in addition to encompassing and summarizing all the others and giving this book its title, is The Pathway. Fundamentally, it is the magical pathway that links each one of the houses to the outside world, the journey of interruption and immersion that is crucial to expressing the architectural concept and the uniqueness of each of the environmental settings. But there are other possible pathways too such as the metaphorical one which links the tourists to Sardinia, or the cultural journeys which Ponis himself has made in the course of his life between Italy, Britain and Sardinia. To compile a book which contains these diverse and varied subjects, geography, tourism, domesticity and the environment, required a careful evaluation of the significance of each and every image. For each house, images both old and new were mixed together, because the book lies halfway between history and topicality. All the drawings were the product of Pony's sensitive hand, and this is certainly of no small importance, given that we live in an era in which autography would appear to be in decline. If you half close your eyes, you realize that this book rather than having to do with the architecture of an architect's houses, in fact has to do with Sardinia. The houses and the pathways created by ponies attempt to generate new myths on this island. They are no longer the old myths based on an uncontaminated sea, on prehistoric monuments and on the island's traditional cuisine, but new myths which arise from its splendid insularity, 
from its poverty as a symbol of inner happiness and thus also, perhaps, from its anomalous modernity. Casa Scalesciani In the final essay of this volume, Jonathan Sergison emphasizes the genuine astonishment which Casa Scalesciani inevitably triggers in its visitors. It is the same sense of vertigo that assaults anyone visiting Falling Water in Bear Run, Pennsylvania, or the Villa Malaparte in Capri. All three of these houses are built on rock and have entered into a dialogue with the water below. What is more, they betray almost nothing of their own logic in that they reveal nothing that might allow us to understand how, or indeed why, anyone would build them in precisely that spot, in places so fiendishly beautiful and complicated. Casa Scalesciani is virtually impossible, as the visitor begins to realize even from the pathway leading to it. It is a narrow, twisting, stone-paved route, little more than a footpath, which appears to have arrived out of nowhere, except that it has to stop just before the precipice of a 40-meter high cliff. This is how the road comes to an end, just above the house, while the house itself occupies the final contour line suitable for building, beyond which comes the empty void where the waves of the sea stirred up by the Mistral have been breaking against the rock since time immemorial. The house, as sinuous as a snake, clings uh, tightly to the rock. All of its rooms are set out in a line and have practically nothing in the way of terraces, balconies or anything associated with outdoor living except for a pocket handkerchief-sized patch of flat ground that has been tiled over and links the house to a tiny swimming pool. This daring swimming pool can be likened to the flat and blistering hot roof of the Villa Malaparte, or to the impetuous and freezing torrent of falling water, since it also demands a good deal of courage and determination on the part of anyone using it. The house, it might be argued, was created for people who seek strong emotions and who are not particularly interested in creature comforts for their own sake. And this is precisely how Ponis remembers the original clients. The house has changed ownership several times since, each of them perhaps frightened by the radical message that the house communicates has added something to make it feel safer, without foreseeing how, with the passage of time, each addition would perhaps be transformed into a loss. And now, some 40 years after its construction, if not actually in need of a conservative restoration, the house does at least deserve a thorough overhaul, one which could restore it to its original heroic state. What is still intact, however, if only because it is impossible to modify, is the path that leads down to the sea. You may not want to follow it if you are not used to the Vie Ferrate in the mountains. In some sections the steps are firmly fixed and the slope is acceptable, but in other parts they are simply cut into or even just sketched into the living rock which makes them difficult to see and hence inadvisably if you have been out in the sun for a few hours and are wearing slippery thongs on your feet. The house is the product of an unrepeatable triangulation of the rules that define building, design and patronage. Casa Scalesciani has an organic, tortured shape, just like the early sinuous white houses such as the Casa Martinez that Ponis constructed in Porto Rafael in the 1960s, approximately 10 years earlier. But it is also as rational and sober as any rural stazzo, the typical Gallurese building type that Ponis had by this time studied, developed, assimilated and replicated. Just like a stazzo, it has a pantile covered roof and very few openings, and it resembles a corridor, the corridor being the inhabited catharsis of a pathway. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for joining me today and see you in the next video. Bye.